How's it going today, folks? Uh, it turns out the name of my YouTube channel is CT Scaper because I am a uh, landscape contractor, landscape designer, uh, lover of plants. So I thought maybe we'd do something different today and I would just kind of walk you around my yard. You know, a while back I used to do these, these walks through the yard. Nobody really watches them, very few people watch them. But, um, you know, I know a lot of people are saying do more videos about plants. So let me walk you through my yard. And I can't really say my yard is anything spectacular right now. Um, but I do have some concepts I want to share with you guys. And just a few kind of highlights I want to share with you guys. Because I think I'm at the phase in my career where uh, I'm not really doing things by the book anymore but just kind of using my intuition and seeing what works and what doesn't work and still referring don't get me wrong still referring to what i've learned in the past and what's recommended but i'm, I'm starting to realize that a lot of the recommendations are based by the people who actually make the products to use so i, I kind of just want to give a different view of things um, so let me show you what I'm doing and, and just, you know, open your mind to some different ways of doing things, different ways of seeing things. And if you want to borrow my ideas, great. And if you don't, that's okay too. Um, but do please right now, you know, hit the like button, watch as much of this video as you can, because the, the reason I don't make a ton of gardening videos is because not many people watch them. So, you know, it, it takes a lot of time to make them, um, especially when I leave plant names, but if nobody's watching them, you know, uh, it's tough. So it's up to you whether you want to watch this one or not, but um, let's get started. So the first thing I want to show you folks is um, these beautiful elephant ears. And these elephant ears, uh, the, the term I use is, they followed me home from the grocery store three years ago. So three summers ago, I was at the grocery store, there was like a one or a two gallon container with an elephant ear with like maybe two, three leaves at the most. They were in front of the store, they were on this, the sale, this cart that said, you know, half off or on sale, I don't know what it was. But I got so excited because I've tried to grow elephant ears in the past and I usually buy the rhizomes, you know, they're these big bulbs like the size of a softball I've stuck them in the ground at least twice in my life and nothing ever happened. So I got so excited that I had live elephant ears. It was probably May or June, brought them home and I was gonna plant them and finally have the elephant ears that since I was a kid, this plant had fascinated me. So that summer, what I did is um, I went out and I bought these three clay pots and those are probably 18 inches in diameter if I had to guess. So the plant, the stem you see in the center here, the tallest stem, that is the elephant ear that I initially planted. And then I put them all in my backyard. We have a, a fairly shady uh, back patio. And, and what I also did is, is when I planted these, I knew they were big plants. So I hope you can appreciate how far below the edge of the pot I made them because I knew I just wanted to dump water on these things. So this is their third season. So, so what I did is put them in the backyard. I water these daily, you know, since then. In the summers, I'll bring them indoors in the winter. So I never, I never take these out of the pots. I bring them in the house. I put some lights on them over the winter. They don't look very good by the end of the winter, but they look you know, they're still green, so then they can bounce back quicker than if I dug out this, this big rhizome. And then as time's gone by, they just slowly, like you'll see over here, if they're happy, they will get, they will get these little offshoots. This actually broke off. I had a branch fall on this pot, which is why there's a different pot here, broke the clay pot. But if they're happy, the first year they got all these side shoots, and then you could break those off. and. I probably should have broken these off this year and repotted them. I will next year. 
But uh, these elephant ears are just, just amazing. Um, and I'll, I'll do a separate video talking about them some more. I have not used any um, weed killers, pesticides, synthetic fertilizers, except for uh, some liquid fertilizer for those elephant ears and my potted plants. But I have gone completely organic. Not so much to say I'm using organic practices. I just don't use synthetic fertilizers, pesticides, fung fungicides, stuff like that. Um, my son's in high school now. The day he was born, I just was like, no, I'm done. Totally done with that stuff. I don't want to be around it. I don't want my kids to be around it. Uh, so we're done. So my lawn, um, my theory on lawns has gone from trying to have, you know, a golf course to having a manicured lawn to having a, a, a thick lawn but to not really be too worried about weeds. Um, so what I do is I did oversee the spring um, and in theory I should oversee every fall in September you would oversee with a uh, with a nice mix of seed that's gonna thicken in bare spots but for me basically what I do is I mow my lawn really tall so I mow the lawn uh, I have a commercial one of those Z-Master mowers I mow this lawn at four inches and I've actually moved it up to four and a quarter and we've had some really rainy weeks where I'll move it up to four and a half so I'm removing as little of the, the grass blade as possible I keep my lawnmower blade as, as sharp as I can, so I'll sharpen the blade once in the spring, usually once by the end of the spring, and maybe one more time late summer. If I'm just mowing my lawn, uh, keep that mower blade sharp, because that way your lawn doesn't look brown, you know, if you have a dull blade. And then the other thing I do is I use the weed whacker to keep my edges nice and neat. So my lawn isn't really like like if you walk on it and you look down at it, I mean, there, there's clover there, you know, there's, there's um, plenty of dandelions. But because I mow it tall, it stays green through the summer. I don't use an irrigation system. If it browns out, that's fine. As soon as the rains come in the fall, it's gonna come back. Um, but it's, it's nice enough, you know, I mean, uh, you know, mowing four inches tall, if you walk across it in the morning, you, you're going to get wet shoes, you know, so use, use garden shoes, slip on garden shoes if you're walking across the yard to, to go to the bird feeders or um, do some weeding or whatever. Okay, and then this little garden is behind the house. Don't look at the house, it needs a lot of work. Um, but this little garden, I mean, look at the size of this maple here. This is one of my favorite spots in the spring because when we moved into this house, there was nothing but like three strands of grass and some moss. And while I'm not a huge fan of hosta, sometimes you just gotta put what's gonna grow. So I spread compost in this area. Uh, I made this stepping stone path and then as time's gone by, I've been filling it in with uh, I don't know if you guys can see, I got a chickadee up on that gutter, which is going to fly away. There's some water up there, you see that? See that little chickadee? Getting a drink. I started birding three or four years ago, and uh, I don't know all my birds on the property, but I... Um, I really do enjoy the birds. So, so I, I, um, you know, I put this S-curve path in, spread compost, started with the hosta, and little by little I've been working my way back, and I finally finished this last year. And so I've got different hosta that flower at different times of the year. I don't know the cultivars. All I do is go to the nursery and buy what looks pretty. Um, not a hosta fanatic. Um, I've got some penstem in here, which has done very well. So I deadheaded that, and it's in the spring it flowers, and then it just turns into uh, stalks, and then I deadheaded it. I'll come back next year. 
And then here we've got um, cardinal flower, you know, because there is a gutter there. And the cardinal flower, you know, sometimes it grows and sometimes it doesn't. And I, I have yet to figure out what the secret is. But um, I call this my, my garbage can cardinal flower. Uh, and it's always fun to see the hummingbirds out here right next to the garbage cans. Maybe not for them. Um, and then I do have an oak leaf hydrangea. It doesn't get enough sun even for an oak leaf. I don't have a ton of flowers, but I think again it's just really cool to be in the shade of uh, a hundred plus year old maple uh, to have that oak leaf hydrangea growing there. And I did, um, you know, I did do some, there's some Tiarella cordifolia in here. Uh, it never really filled in nice. I, I've got a little bleeding heart. So I think my Tiarella is going to go and I'm just going to fill this in with either more more hosta or see if I can find something else. And maybe the Tiarella will, you know, self-sow in the middle of a hosta, but I, I like Tiarella, but for whatever reason, it's just not really doing it over here. So now we're in the, the front of the house and um, you know, if, if you've watched my videos, there's my Stewardia Pseudocamellia. When I planted this tree, I really did think uh, there was plenty of room between the tree and the house. You know, it was a little five to six foot B&B &B bald and burlap tree, and that's how far it's grown. And if I was going to plant this tree now, I would probably plant it another five feet away from the house. Uh, easy. So one thing, you know, any of my, my gardeners or, you know, younger people going into the trade, never be afraid to increase the spacing between your plants and never be afraid to plant things farther from the house. I assure you that even though it may look silly the first year or two, everything grows, you know, in landscaping. So don't be afraid, look at how much, you know, this, this tree's come in, don't be afraid to move it away. Um, I, as time goes by, there's these two branches here I'll prune off. This is going to be fine. It, it may at some point make the sidewalk a little bumpy as the roots grow, but um, we'll work with it because I love this tree. And, and I also want to show you on this tree, you know, so I, I planted this when it was just a little nothing. And I made sure I took the time to make sure I had the flare. You see the flare, the root flare there? Took the time to dig the, the soil back and make sure the root flare was at the top of the tree. And look at how nice that, that's the way a tree is supposed to grow. The flare is right there. The roots are right along the top of the soil. You never want to see a tree growing straight into the soil because that means it was planted too deep and it's not good for the tree. And it takes more time to plant a tree like this, but this tree is healthy and happy. Um, for what it's worth. And then over here, um, so these are Varder Valley boxwood. There used to be three Varder Valley boxwood here. Uh, at one point in the winter, I was using a bigger machine and I, I accidentally bumped one of them and, and killed it. So for years we've only had two. This spring I went back out and um, bought another one because we also made this bed bigger. If you look at some of my older videos, we added this light over here. But I just want you to compare. This is a, a, this is a Varder Valley box, what I bought in the spring, which was sheared. It's, it's, it's already opening up. But look at the inside of the shrub. Look at, look at how there's nothing growing in there. And then these are Varder Valley boxwood that were probably around this size when I planted them 15 years ago, if not longer. And I've only selected, pr selectively pruned these for the last 10 years. And it looks like a totally different shrub. But I mean, the growth goes all the way in. And I have not pruned these shrubs at all this year. The nice thing about selectively pruning, for people new to the concept, selectively pruning, so if you shear a shrub, you just take a hedge clipper 
and make a ball or a box or a pyramid out of it. If you selectively prune, you go in with your pruners and you selectively prune the branches at different lengths and, and different amounts into the shrub to allow air and light to get into them. And the shrub ends up looking a lot more natural. Boxwood doesn't want to grow like this, but man makes it. So I, I guess I just want to kind of show you the difference with selective, selective pruning and shearing and I probably won't even touch this for two to three years or I may just thin it out a bit. This is kind of fun too folks. So um, when the electrician put the post lamp in I asked him for a plug and, and he put a plug in and it's a little more obtrusive than, than I'd like and that's on me but um, I wanted to do something to hide the plug. So this spring I went out and I bought four pots, four clay pots. And for whatever reason, I really love the color pink. Um, it, it's a very happy color. It's a very bright color. So I, I got some of these pink impatiens because of the shade of the Stewardia. And when I planted these, they were literally like two inches tall because I think the nursery I got them, I bought them at Lowe's actually. I think they were using what's called a growth regulator, which encourages plants to be bushy and short. Um, but when I put them in, they were like two inches tall. As the summers progressed, I've been watering the bejesus out of them. I water these literally every day. Impatience and those elephant ears, if you've got them, you can never water them enough. So I've been watering them daily, I've been fertilizing, and uh, you know, look how much they've grown. You see in there. Um, and watch this, the coolest thing about impatience. See this? See where this flower, the seed pot is? I don't know if I can do this. I love that. <laughs> so, so these things have taken over. Now deer love impatience. So if you're going to grow impatience, I would not plant them where deer can get to them. I, I, I would recommend a, if you have a fenced in patio or pool area or, or deck. Um, but the deer have munched this one in half about a month ago and they munched this one in half. You can see where they were munching it. And uh, they did that about two weeks ago. And the impatience within a week just they just grow new buds and, and grow out of it. You can kind of see over here that where the deer didn't nibble, it would have been this tall, this long, but where the deer did nibble, it's this long. So, um, honestly, with these impatience, I could come in with a pair of scissors and just cut them all in half, and that would encourage them to be more bushy. And the other thing, and I know I showed you popping that seed pod, but it's been such a damp year here in New, Engl New England that all these impatient seed pods have been falling on the ground, and those are nothing but impatient seedlings on the ground. I mean, every one of these plants you see down there are impatient seedlings. And it's just kind of... I guess the word would be funny. I, I bought these on sale and it was $7.50 a pot. When, you know, if I just overwintered them, I, I had more than enough here. You know, maybe I should just dig out some swaths of this ground, bring them in the house, and then I'll have some, some seedlings for next year. The seedlings may not be as deep pink. You know, they may be lighter, they may be darker. You know, they're not going to be the same, but who cares? You know, they're still going to be pretty. Then uh, this part of the garden, I have this meadow rue, which I think I have a picture. I took a picture of this a while back. But this meadow rue seedling, because I've been doing no mulch and I'm not perfect weeding, plants have gotten away from me and, and weeds have gotten away from me. But when you're weeding, if you keep your eyes open, sometimes you'll be surprised what you find. 
So this meadow rue started to grow over here because last spring I planted this, this little boxwood hedge and I used some old soil I, you know, I had in the backyard with compost from the garden and this, this meadow root grow, grew. And I just love, you know, I'm not saying leave every seedling, seedling you see in the garden. I'm not saying pull every seedling you see in the garden. But just when you see something, when you're weeding, I think the difference between like a sterile garden and a garden that's alive is, is, is a garden that's alive is gonna have some of these random plants coming up and just adding interest, you know? And, and if anything, it's adding a little bit of cohesion because I have a seedling here of a plant I have in the backyard. Um, whereas a, a sterile garden, which seems to be a lot of what In my area of suburbia, most people seem to want two to three inches of mulch. And, and don't get me wrong, I've got plenty of videos talking about how two to three inches of mulch is ideal, but let's have two to three inches of mulch. Let's have no weeds. Let's have everything perfectly pruned into little balls or squares or pyramids. And I'm thinking you know, and again, maybe that's the difference between being artistic and just making it look nice. And I don't know how many people are going to appreciate the artistic version, but to have a few plants coming up here and there, to not have all your plants suffocating in mulch, you know, I, I still am an advocate of nice clean edges, don't get me wrong there. But I, I think there's a better way, and I think the better way is actually using less inputs and giving better results. So just a quick aside in, in this part of the garden, this here is Newport Blue Boxwood. I probably cut this back by about three feet this spring, two to three feet. Um, so I hadn't pruned this one. With selective pruning, it's not like I go out every year and, and say, oh God, it's June, I gotta prune, you know. When they need to be pruned, I prune them. And, and usually what I'll do is, is I won't just go and try and prune everything all at once as I'm working in the garden I would just come through and you know just hit the really long ones I might reach in once in a while and cut something back you know just because I don't want to have all my you know all my cuts on the same plane I want to keep some height variation this is my dawn redwood um, I planted this tree again it was five to six feet tall and this is how quickly a dawn redwood grows Metasequoia Glyptostraboides and uh, I have a video on my channel where you'll see my children trying to climb this tree when my son was maybe five or six and my daughter was I don't know three or four and my son can now go up this tree like nothing and I, I climbed this tree myself and I kind of thinned out the branches you see this cut here I think I did this this spring. I mean, these trees heal ridiculously fast. I'm not sure if this one was this spring, but I mean, they heal so fast. And um, what I did is I went up and I tried to make it so you can still climb up through the branches, but as this tree gets older, some of the branches start to die. I only went up maybe 30 feet. It's getting a little nervous. But I mean, it's just such a, such a different thing and such a beautiful thing and this one again i you know I, I worked very hard to make sure the flare was at the ground but this tree is such a such a um, aggressive grower I, I think it would have done that anyways um, if you folks are in connecticut the bartlett arboretum in stanford has some really old ones if you want to see how how huge these get so it's it's late september and um I just want to talk about self-sowing again, so, so if you look up here, there's a gutter up there which quite often fills up and starts dripping. It comes down to here, but this gutter quite often gets filled up and starts dripping, so I've made it my practice to, you know, if I find spare rocks or have extra bricks, I'll put them over here to, to break the water up so it doesn't splash up the dirt. 
but this columbine started growing here and this is one of my favorite parts of the yard and you know this columbine is so happy it's actually flowering again in the fall but um, all the growth pretty much from where my finger is here down that all happened this year because it's been such a wet year that things have been growing like gangbusters and you see we got this is a piece of uh, anthracite coal you know my house is 200 years old and somebody missed a piece of coal I think that's pretty cool this garden I, I literally haven't touched in like two months <laughs> so for anybody watching the video who's like wow I want my gardens look like his don't worry I have the same gardens you know no matter how good you are or think you are time is gonna catch up with you if you don't and maybe that's another point I should make you know you you need to regularly maintain your gardens and in the trade I, I see a lot of um, people call me in the spring to do the the weed and mulch you know the edge and the spring edge and mulch and then maybe I can convince them to have me back one other time in the fall to you know do some deadheading of perennials and maybe they'll let me come back and do some pruning in June and you know I, I understand not everybody can afford a gardener or has the time to do the work themselves but I guess I just want to say that you know the more often you can get out in the gardens the better and the mistake I'll make quite often is I'll wait until a garden looks like this to get out and do something when here's a garden that I actually did get to maybe a month ago and um, I should when they look like this you know get out and do something because it's much easier to keep up with we do leave coneflower the um, the yellow finches love to eat the seeds so if you have purple coneflower please leave the seeds you know leave the um, the flower heads all winter uh, the gold finches love them but um, you know if you can get out I don't know if it's weekly every other week the more often the better because it's so much easier to, to do the work and it's much more enjoyable as well it goes from you know walking through this mess like I would this is baptisia baptisia you know I, at this time of year I would just cut it right back to the ground and then this um, this is some kind of rutabecchia which I should know but I don't but it's it's already flowered once and then the secondary flowers are coming so if you were out early you could before this this rutabecchia bloomed you could cut the whole shrub in half and delay the blooming later uh, or after it bloomed you could deadhead it and then you might get some more flowers or you can do what I did and just never get out and do nothing and you know it's still kind of cool how you've got your first flowers and then your secondary flowers coming earlier in my career I just come through and cut everything back and leave a big clump of foliage there but this is kind of nice to look at you know our, our kitchen windows to the left it's kind of nice to look at so you know maybe you just let it go and the, the, the more often you're out doing the maintenance you can say you know what this week I'm just gonna let this go or, or maybe maybe you do just deadhead you know the older flowers I, they kind of look nice to me you know um, maybe it worked out better because sometimes when I when I forget to get out and do the work I learn things like this um, funny story I planted cannas in this garden about three years ago haven't grown them since and this year I noticed this guy coming up so this little patch back here is um, we're gonna call this my trial garden I don't know what to call it I mean it's it's my home for wayward shrubs so any evergreens I have I'll put back here and I just kind of create a backdrop in the garden um, and then what I've been doing I have a video where I talk about you know just mulching your leaves into the lawn 
Uh, we've got two ginormous maple trees here, maple trees here. Um, there's too many leaves. There probably would be 8 to 12 inches of leaves if you just let them fall in this part of the yard. So what I've started doing is I'll mow them a few times and then I'll start to work pointing my mower this way and once they're basically made into you know leaf compost I'll, I'll just blow them this way and, and usually I'll have to take a leaf blower and blow them over as well but I did that just to kind of see how it worked out and I mean the the daffodils in the spring I had all these mounds of daffodils coming up here so you just go out with a rake and you rake the um, the leaves off of them and they grew perfectly fine and I guess not everybody's got as many trees as I have and I'm kind of jealous of you but at the same token I have great shade all summer so you know I, I like that too but you know uh, every spring I go out and buy mulch and spread it at my customers houses but meanwhile we've got all these trees here with all these leaves dropping and we take the nutrients of the leaves and blow them in the woods or have somebody come suck them up and take them away then we pay some guy to bring chemicals to make the grass grow greener because it needs nutrients and then we pay somebody to kill the insects in our lawn which kills the beneficial insects as well and I just feel like maybe maybe we're, we're we need to kind of recognize the situation for what it is and you know work more on getting back to working with nature rather than rather than working against her and I know there's groups I, I did take the there's a group called NOFA the Northeast Organic Farmers Association they teach a lot about this stuff much more detail than I do but I think right now I'm just trying to recognize that maybe I've just been going with the program all these years and maybe I want to start start writing my own program as opposed to just doing what everybody else is doing and I just want to ask you if, if maybe you want to even if you don't start doing something right away just start questioning the way we're doing things and thinking about if maybe there's a better way so that's going to do it for today. Oh, final thing, uh, Actaea root. Love this plant. Very poisonous. Don't eat the berries. Don't grow it if you have small children. Um, we've got foxes, we've got rabbits, we've got possums, we've got raccoons, we've got squirrels, we've got chipmunks. They have the common sense not to eat this stuff. It's a native around here. But if you're a human, don't eat the stuff. If you have dogs, but I mean, how cool is that, right? Okay guys, so I have like no light. Uh, I had to find this one ray of light to, uh, to do my closing in. But I hope I gave you guys some ideas, made you think outside the box. Um, you're welcome to try to make me think outside the box. Throw some ideas up there of, of what you're doing to use less pesticides. Basically, get better results with less work and no pesticides or synthetic chemicals. I really think there are things we're missing that, that we could do better and, and that's been on my mind a lot lately. Oops, I missed the sun. So, you know, let me know. Um, don't forget to like the video, don't forget to subscribe to the channel and the more, the more love garden videos get, the more garden videos I can make and we'll see what happens. Thanks for watching, guys, and have a great day. Take care.